Welcome to this edition of the uh, NITEX uh, NITEP <laughs> colloquium. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Professor Nitaya Chetty. Uh, um, Professor Chetty is uh, at the moment the Dean of Science at the University of the Witwatersrand, <clears throat> but many of you might remember him as one of the as one of the presidents of the SAIP uh, a few years ago. Uh, he also served as a Dep deputy chief executive <clears throat> of the of the NRF. Yeah, in particular, he was in charge of astronomy at the time where uh, Meerkat was uh, was was set up. <clears throat> yeah, uh, he's also at the moment uh, one of the vice presidents uh, of the International Union of Pure, Pure and Applied Physics (IUPAP) and is in charge of of membership, if I <laughs> understand it correctly. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> in the past, he's been uh, the recipient of the prestigious uh, Fulbright Fellowship. <clears throat> And uh, uh, and has been involved with uh, with, with NITEP many times over the years. At some stage, even one of the first deputy directors of the node at uh, uh, at UKZ10. So NITEP, thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon, and uh, for agreeing to to share with us uh, some of the ideas that you that you published recently in one of the um, journals of uh, of the American Physical Society. And uh, uh, I know this is probably not a technical talk, but uh, it's very important to have also uh, some more philosophical <laughs> talks uh, every now and then. Yeah. So Nitya, people are here to to listen to you and to uh, hear what um, what you what you want to share with us about the role of uh, basic sciences essentially for for Africa. Okay, we can see your your ah, fantastic. Now it's on full screen. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Nitya. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. I appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with, with colleagues about uh, the, the importance of science, in particular um, basic, uh, fundamental, unfitted science, however way you want to describe that, and, and, and its important role in, in, in the broader uh, research and education uh, environment. Now, the title of the talk is Aim for the Sky, Keep Your Feet on the Ground. This was basically the title of a um, commentary that I was asked to provide. So the American Physical Society had, had approached me to write a, a brief and, and uh, they had gotten in touch with me because of the years I've actually written from time to time, but they had picked up on, on a previous uh, commentary that I made in the South African Journal of Science. So it's, it's good to know that they are actually looking at, at the South African um, journals in this context. So they produced a very nice uh, graphic for me here. So that was done specifically for my presentation. And, uh, and you could see that I, I was being quite provocative and, and in, in, in much of what I, had, uh, what, what I chose, to, chose to say. Um, so, so a point that that was picked up by a number of folk because uh, after publication, uh, I did get comments from from a number of places, uh, particularly in the United States and Europe. I think uh, this particular comment here, unless African countries aim for the highest levels of scientific research excellence within a milieu of unfettered inquiry, the continent will continue to languish on the treadmill of poverty and inequality. So a lot of folk actually commented on that. They felt that I was being quite assertive, but I believe in that very strongly. And, and so I was most delighted, uh, Francesco, when you approached me to ask to, to speak about uh, my, my presentation. So I interpreted that, that as meaning that you wanting a, a justification, particularly of that statement. So much of my, my presentation will really be speaking to that. Now, you could look at the article. It was a fairly short article. I, I myself uh, didn't think that it was a fantastic piece I, because it's very consistent with the things that I think about all of the time. Uh, so, so I was quite surprised with the, with the uh, feedback that I did get um, and very heartened by that. Um, so, so the key points, and, and you can look at, at the article, the key points was that science is an instrument uh, for development. We know this, it's, it's important to, to develop science. Uh, and, and, and in so doing, you, you, you uh, develop uh, excellent uh, scientists, as well as opportunities to, to make meaningful contributions for, for society. Uh, I made the point that 
obviously in a developing context such as in, in Africa more generally that education and applied research is, is, is clearly important. But I, but I was quite, quite firm that one should not focus on, on these aspects exclusively. Uh, that open unfettered research is an engine room for, for scientific culture. Of course, uh, research, excellent research for the sake of, of doing research is an important part of our culture. We always, uh, many, many funding agents now take a very utilitarian uh, view about research, but I think we've got to keep in mind that uh, the intellectual pursuit is, still remains a, a, a very high ideal um, and, and excellence as a judge by, by peers, not by managers or, or bureaucrats. And that, that in itself is, 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 a, is a noble cause. But um, unfettered research is, is also a basis upon which you can create a more innovative society. <clears throat> and I will speak a good deal about that. And in particular, I will touch on some of the very definite uh, initiatives that, that we have, um, have uh, introduced at, at Wits University in the context of driving innovations in a, in a more formal and more, uh, more constructed way. Um, obviously, uh, research is, is, is a basis for education. Uh, you're always needing to improve on, on, on what you deliver in the classroom and, and that, that has to be research level. It cannot be static. Uh, the quantum mechanics that we teach today should, should really be quite different from what was taught 100 years ago. And, and, and that's just the, the evolution of, of the subject material based on, on research. Obviously, it's also the basis for applied research, and, and I'll say a little bit more uh, about that. But I, I received this comment from somebody at Caltech. Like I said, I did have a number of, of folk that wrote, wrote to me, and, and they felt quite, quite uh, moved by some of the things that I said. Uh, and, and he wrote me saying that the wealth of a society can be measured in the dreams of its children. And I did say to him that I was going to plagiarize that. And it is true. So, so keep in mind that that uh, research is, is, is an important source of hope. And I use the examples of, of astronomy, hence the, the image that was, was designed for, for my purpose. Uh, and, and of course, uh, in terms of uh, blue sky research, uh, nothing could be considered to be more esoteric or, or, or fundamental than astronomy is. And, and yet, uh, yet it is, it, it has been supported so, so greatly within South Africa. And of course, it's, it's the hope that, that we give a new generation of, of students, uh, many of whom for generations have been deprived of, of, a, of a good quality education. And one should not underestimate that. And, and I thought that that was a very pertinent point that, uh, that we want to, want to make sure that our, our children have dreams, dreams of being excellent in terms of science. Now, I referred to earlier the, the paper uh, commentary that I wrote in the South African Journal of Science. You can pick that up um, with some of these notions we, we, we perhaps uh, touched upon. Reinventing inventiveness in science. I, I happen to think that some of science has become quite mundane and routine, and we need to really uh, inject a lot more energy and new ideas into science. And so that was the base of this, this article. I'm not going to summarize this, but it appeared in the South African Journal of Science. Uh, a little more than a year ago, and that was what the APS picked up on. Now, insofar as the things that we do in, in society, I think it's important, uh, pardon me, within the university research environment, I think the, this, uh, the so-called past years quadrant uh, or idea is an important way to think about the, the, the different elements of, of what we do. If we look at a schematic of, of the quest for fundamental understanding versus the consideration of, of practical use, then, uh, the, the, then the top left-hand corner would be, um, which is referred to as the, as the Bohr quadrant, is, is really the pursuit of fundamental research. And, and of course, uh, you know that Bohr had a Danish physicist received the Nobel Prize about 100 years ago now. And uh, for his, basically, I would say, for, for uh, setting the foundations for quantum mechanics, of course, we know that his, his basic theory was flawed, uh, and that in itself is an interesting interesting point in this context. But uh, but we, we probably cannot put a price tag on on the consequences, the the material benefits, the technological advances that have accrued from from um, from our basic understanding, fundamental understanding, quantum mechanical understanding of electrons and solids brought about 
by, by the developments of, of, of that period of time. So scientists, generally speaking, and I'm not really referring here mostly to physics, although I'm, I'm presumably mostly addressing a group of physicists, I think really my, my comments would, would apply to, to all scientists working in, in the domain of pure unfettered research. That, that they pursue these areas with academic interests in mind. And, uh, and it is left to others downstream to, to really make those practical connections, if at all, there's no guarantee and we know that. Now the bottom right hand quadrant referred to as the Edison quadrant is, referred, uh, is, is named after Thomas Edison, the American inventor who worked a lot on the electricity is well known for, the, for having invented the light bulb. So scientists working in this area uh, would be referred to as applied scientists. And so they would, would uh, would, would apply established scientific knowledge to, to, to solving practical problems. Now, there's, there's, there is this inherent understanding that there will be a steady stream of new ideas, new principles, new, new observations, new empirical results that will always ensure that applied research is, 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 is an active and, and, and uh, vibrant <clears throat> research endeavor. So, so quite clearly, you do need you do need uh, basic fundamental research if that's going to be the engine room of, of, of applied ideas. But for me, <clears throat> the context in the context of what I wish to present today, the the top right hand corner quadrant referred to as the pasture quadrant is is most important and and and, and very appealing. Uh, <clears throat> named after Louis Pasteur, the the French uh, microbiologist and chemist who made pasteurization uh, popular, we probably take that for granted. He understood that uh, fermentation processes and, and disease as well formed by, by microorganisms. And he tried to understand the, um, the, the source of these problems. Um, he's he's um, credited with saving the French uh, uh, cheese and, and, and wine industry, it turns out, by, by trying to understand basic research in the service of specific and immediate problems. So, uh, so, so really we have scientists working in this area that, that uh, basically try to solve uh, problems facing society by inquiring fundamentally the source of those, those problems and trying to resolve this with, with the view to, to fundamental research. Or they could be apply, uh, looking at, at fundamental questions in nature and, and uh, exploring uh, uh, real, real application. So you have a single individual, nobody's passing the buck here really. And that's the important thing for you to note that you, you produce a single individual who has this dual, this dual kind of outlook on life. And I think increasingly now you will see many more scientists within the university environment really being driven to, to become much more innovative. I think that more so in, in future, many of the problems residing in this quadrant would be, uh, would, would involve multidisciplinary terms, very likely large multidisciplinary terms, because many of the problems facing humanity are very large and, and complex and require multidisciplinary approach. And, and so I, I, would, I would say that, that the modern university in the 21st century will need to be producing many more uh, innovative students, researchers, academics that, uh, that, that approach their work uh, in, 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 this, in this manner. And, and obviously society needs this and, and, and this, is, this is really important that we now begin to give this attention. Now, if you look at education, <clears throat> the way we conceive of it, you might think of this as high school education, or undergraduate education, possibly even parts of the honors program, then education really res uh, resides in this bot bottom left-hand quadrant. And I think you get a sense of, of the way, ways in which I'm thinking about, about the different elements of, of the ways in which we pursue our work within the university environment. So, so on the matter of education, clearly it is important for society, and I made the point very pointedly in, in my presentation that, uh, that education and applied research is important, but we, we should not do this exclusively or, or without working in a milieu of, of uh, academic excellence, um, yeah. unfettered research. Um, so, so, so with regard to education, I've already kind of alluded to that there is a need for curriculum evolution. We cannot be static in terms of what we teach and how we teach. And of course, with modern technology that has changed quite a bit in ways in which we approach education, I think that our education should always be research led. 
politically in South Africa, there's been a, a, a lot of discussion for the past decade around, uh, around the uh, colonization debate uh, uh, and, and, and what that means in terms of science. I think that's essentially a, a, a political discussion, but any, any uh, self-respecting institution should always be exploring its cu curriculum and asking the tough questions about its relevance. In the South African context, and I'm really um, directing a lot of my remarks in the context of the developing world, obviously excellence in teaching is important. I, I think when we were students, Francesco and myself and others of our age group, I think uh, you, you often had lecturers that, that had a don't, don't care attitude. I experienced that. It was take it or leave it. And if, if you fell by the wayside, then so be it. But today, given our long history of, of, of uh, of uh, disenfranchisement and, and, and lack of access to education. And, and now we have the legacy of underprepared students. We do need to pay a lot of attention to education. That is important. I do want to say that the role and function of the university deep in the 21st century does need to be interrogated. It's, its shape and form, role and function is different, very different. It has to be, and we need to plan for that. But those are just my comments about education. But clearly, we cannot focus our attention in, entirely on education, because if we did, we'd be some kind of education college or in the USA you have the community colleges in South Africa you have various uh, varsity college and that sort of setup that's not not a, a I don't want to be too disparaging here but but that would not be on par with a with a research-led university on the top left hand quadrant that I've already referred to the all universities all excellent universities are founded on, on the ball quadrant and that would apply to all all disciplines not just theoretical physics I think in using these terms, I'm probably gonna be lambasted for being a little bit parochial here, but, but these comments do apply to all disciplines, whether it's in the humanities, health sciences, other, other disciplines within science as well. And obviously uh, theoretical physics does epitomize this approach undoubtedly. This is, uh, this is uh, open unfettered research of the, of the highest order. The important thing to note is that within this milieu of, 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 of unfettered research is where you, where you attract the best students and, and the best academics. That's what our best students want. They want to work in such an environment. Now, you cannot ignore that. You can try to drive the system in a different direction, but your best students will always want to be working in, in, this, in this type of environment. It forms the, 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 the foundations of an excellent university. You, if, if, you, if you damage that, I think you, you're going to run into difficulties. Obviously, the same will apply to research laboratories and institutes and centers and so on. So, so my claim uh, is, is that if we do not support open-ended research, we will destroy the basis of, of what, a, what an excellent university should be. If we go on quickly then to the bottom right-hand quadrant, obviously society needs more practical solutions to re real-world problems. I'm not wanting to underplay that. I think funding agents have tried to push us very strongly into the bottom right hand quadrant. They've often caused a lot more harm than good. They've not really, uh, bureaucrats, I think, or academic has been who tend to get into these positions of control do, do tend to uh, not understand the, the interplay between basic fundamental research and, and, and pure applied research. I think you've heard this adage that you cannot apply science if there's no science to apply. And I've already kind of alluded to that point a little bit earlier. So, so whilst applied research is extremely important, particularly in the African context, uh, it, we, we should not be doing this simply exclusively or else we will fail to be a university. We could call ourselves a university of technology and, and you have your own views about the status and quality of our universities of technology in South Africa. That's what will be the end result and we, we, we should be mindful of that. Top right hand qu quadrant then is, is where I'm quite excited about uh, now that I'm Dean of Science at Bits University pursuing this very, very uh, in, a, in a much more concerted way. The ideas of innovation, in my view, need to become much more mainstreamed into our academic programs. I think uh, for the longest time, they've been too, too much on the periphery and, and we need to change that. Uh, the notions of, of innovation are certainly set to grow, not only in South Africa, but also around the world. Uh, the, the world is crying out for, for more innovative solutions to many problems that are facing all of humanity. And, uh, and of course, uh, if you look more immediately at the poor state of our economy, not only in South Africa, then, then I think it's something that we must take, take more seriously. So innovation, I believe, is, is, um, is important for, our for the future of our universities and, and certainly at Wits University, um, I'm trying to champion that very strongly. 
Now, I'm not about to say that innovations are not occurring or that somehow uh, this is a new concept. If you look over the last few, few decades, then, uh, the, then there are many excellent examples of research having been successfully commercialized. Um, and and, and that, is, that is wonderful. It's important to, to uh, consider those, those examples because um, they're, they're very inspirational. But, uh, researchers currently continue to work on problems of, with enormous potential for commercial gain. And, uh, and I think we do have an ecosystem that does exist within our university environments, but also, also broadly in South African society. Now you can argue, is, is this ecosystem working well enough? That is a different question, but you know, it can certainly be oiled a little bit better. I'm sure we can argue for that, but there's a broad ecosystem that has, has a record of, of assisting our students and so on. The IEC ecosystem, I think we need to be driving innovations in a more coordinated way within our universities. <clears throat> so often, often these ideas are simply seen as a source of third stream income. It's a very narrow view, I, I feel, and, and, and we need to think about that. So, so there are uh, gaps <clears throat> within the broad IEC uh, ecosystem within our institutions. And, and I would really urge academics, even those within the theoretical disciplines to work more conscientiously toward identifying and addressing those gaps. In particular, I often find that these terms I, E, and C, yeah, in innovation, entrepreneurship, and commercialization, use rather interchangeably. And I think more now, more than ever before, we need to be able to untangle these ideas and, and uh, think about them, uh, how, how the one relates to the other, the other a little bit, a little more uh, carefully. So, so the current system also focuses perhaps too much on IP as if that's the holy grail, too much on, on, on patents. I think in, in the developing world, we need to take a much more practical approach uh, from, from intellectual concept, try to drive that all the way through to a commercially viable, viable uh, idea by way of some sort of prototype uh, without getting too hung up on what I think is now become, becoming quite an albatross around our neck, which is to manage the patenting of just about every idea that might might emerge out of your laboratory. So, so the um, mainstream of mainstreaming of innovation, I think it needs to be brought much more in, into an, in an integrated fashion into our academic programs. And here, all faculties have a role to play. It's not just the faculty of science. And when I use science in my presentations, colleague, I really want to use. I don't want to come across as being too narrow here. I do, do refer to all, all research-led disciplines, kind of like the Academy of Science. They use that term science to cover everything that, that uh, be way beyond the Faculty of Science. So, so uh, obviously we need to impart uh, practical, uh, marketable skills to our students. I think we're doing reasonably well. As a computational physicist, I'm always keen on imparting to my students practical skills that will enable them to, to, to go on to succeed uh, practical computing skills to succeed in areas far removed from academia. I think generally speaking across all disciplines, we, we are doing that. Uh, educating our students about job uh, prospects. I, I think to, to, it's debatable how well we're doing here. Uh, and sometimes I'm quite surprised that even fairly senior students are, are not, not aware of, of the job possibilities, however limited those might be in South African society. But this is an area that I think that we need to be giving a lot more attention to now and and I think that, that it's not been done so well enough. And when I talk about having a more concerted effort, I think we need to think more deeply about how we can inspire our graduates. And, and many of my comments uh, to come will really refer mostly to our PhD graduates because my greatest concerns lie, lie in that area. How can we inspire graduates? I like to uh, use the term inspire. How can we inspire graduates? to be able to create uh, job opportunities in the marketplace uh, rather than just simply occupy job opportunities. I think in the past this has been left far too much to accident and now we need to plan for this much more deliberately because as I've said, the country does need this. A big concern that I have, and I think we all should have this worry is that the rather limited number of academic and research positions in South Africa, but that would be the case around the world. The future is really looking difficult the higher education sector now you know especially in, in in the areas that we that we pursue in the sciences we, we encourage our students to go all the way we, we attract some really bright students and we you know they're really creative and very very talented uh, very smart 
we kind of uh, encourage them to go all the way to do a PhD and uh, they might uh, then get a postdoc done and they look about themselves and, and, and look for an academic job and they're rather few and far in between. And uh, so what do we do then? Uh, do we turn our back on our students and say, now it's your problem? I think, I think that's a problem. That is a, that is a big worry for me. And, and I, I feel that we, we, we have a huge moral uh, responsibility to, to address this question. Uh, I, I believe uh, very strongly that we now need to be equipping our best students coming into science uh, to enable them to use the education, the experience, knowledge, and so on, to become more innovative in society. I, I, I think that this needs now to become a more attractive goal for our best students, not something that is just an afterthought after having tried to look for an academic position, not failing in that, and then desperately going out to look for something that could work for them in, in broad um, broad society, uh, commerce, and industry. I think we now need to plan for that in a, in, a, in a clearer way. Now, obviously, there are many challenges. There are many folk that have thought carefully about these, these, uh, these matters. Because immediately folk will ask, well, are we going to be diluting our academic programs? Uh, will we simply be turning our universities into technologies, uh, technology centers? And I'm quite emphatic about, about it, that the answer to that is, is no, that we would actually be enhancing our academic programs, enhancing our research by by also developing a more innovative um, culture within our universities. Uh, we, we ought to be thinking of research and innovation as supporting each other. These two agendas are not uh, mutually exclusive. I don't believe so. And we've got to find better ways in which they, they can, can support each other where the research enhances innovation and, and also the, in, in an up, upstream sort of effect with innovation supports the research and drives new research and and that that is a very real prospect out of out of this this type of milieu that i hope that we can establish at our major universities in south africa so it does require more thought and more discussion and hence you know the purpose of my presentation yeah, i hope that we can have a, a uh, exchange on, on some of the ideas that are present so i've been dean of science um, for a little more than a year, and uh, I've, I've been working closely with a colleague in the United States, Professor Suri Ragu, who's now been appointed um, visiting professor in the Faculty of Science, and, and he's really been quite an inspiration and a great source of support, uh, and I hope that at some stage he will be able to visit us here in South Africa. He actually has a long association with South Africa through the physics community. He, he led many workshops on, on these ideas around innovation. And, and also, I do want to recognize the late uh, Dr. Neville Cummins, who passed away just a little more than a year ago. He was also very instrumental in, in assisting me to think about how we can drive innovation through our university system in a much more uh, formal way, rather than leave this to, to, to accident, which is what I think is the problem. So, so colleagues, uh, we currently produce around 3,000 PhDs per year in South Africa. For the past two years, we just clipped that. But already some years ago, uh, the, the government had set as an aspirational target 6,000 PhDs per year across all disciplines in, in about four years from now. So we're not gonna make that, I don't believe so. But it's, it's interesting to understand government's intention in driving PhD production. There was an intent, and the intent that was that there would be this correlation between increased PhD, PhD production and ultimately a positive impact on, on, on the economy. Of, of that, there's no doubt. And I think we, we do have that, that, that responsibility to try to bridge that gap a little bit more, more firmly. So within WITS, we have, <clears throat> have, have a, a strategic plan to grow our postgraduate numbers. So, so within the Faculty of Science, we are, we are actually growing our numbers to 45% of the total student pop population. And uh, uh, incidentally, in, in the year 2019, we graduated uh, um, uh, 100, exactly 100 PhD students, the Faculty of Science. <clears throat> and I checked the record, it's not one more, one less, it's exactly 100, I don't know how that happened. But but this year already, um, so graduating this year with students in the 2020 cohort, uh, we're already exceeding uh, 100 by, by a long way. So, so we are certainly generating PhDs in, in large numbers. So many of my comments then, uh, when I talk about driving innovation through the uh, postgraduate pipeline, refer to postgrad uh, to the PhD. Although the, my no the notions that I present are obviously applicable at, at multiple levels, but I'm, I'm mostly concerned with the PhD students, and you'll see in a moment why. 
I've already commented that the academic uh, that, there, that there's a dearth of academic jobs. Uh, the se sector is not growing. We have two uh, universities that come have come online recently, Salt Lake and at the one out at Mpumalanga, but they're fairly modest in terms of the growth trajectories, and I don't see th those institutions growing at a, at an alarming rate. So, so we should see this as, a, as an opportunity then as we drive our PhD production that we really think more creatively about how we can turn our students uh, into more innovative graduates where they can service a, a genuine need within our broad uh, science and innovation ecosystem in the country. And, uh, and, and, uh, and if we don't do this, I think we, we, would, we would cause immeasurable harm, I think, to, to our research, uh, to our research endeavors within, within the university. So we've got to increasingly now really believe in our youth. That's where I'm, I'm putting a lot of my efforts in. We want our, I mean, you would find actually the new generation as much as, as parents and, and older generation tend to criticize uh, students of, 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 of today, but you will see that that there are many, many young folk uh, that they do care about society. They do care about the, the awful uh, legacy that, that our generation and previous generations are leaving to them. And, and that is an opportunity to get them more involved in, in, in helping solve pro problems that are relevant for society. So that is an opportunity and we should think about that. So what we don't need is, is uh, uh, our, our PhDs, uh, particularly in theoretical physics, I should say, cheekily driving taxis in downtown Johannesburg. Um, I'm sure I can hear a few chuckles in the background. So, uh, underemployment of our graduates would be uh, will be just as bad, if not worse, because it will have this back pressure onto our higher education system. So, they, so there's funding provided for PhDs. If we're not uh, we're not producing employable uh, employable graduates. Uh, the moment we lose societal support for, for our universities, there will be dire consequences. So you, you also need we also need to read, understand the, the, the politics of this time. So it is a huge uh, responsibility. Now, I'm mostly talking about the general degrees, isn't it? Like physics and chemistry and and, uh, and and various different research endeavors within the health sciences. Obviously, you have professional degrees like dentistry and uh, architecture and so on. I can't say that I'm terribly concerned about those folk. Not many of them pursue the PhD, but but in principle, they do have real job opportunities. They can also create. They do have the skills skill set to enable themselves to set the set, set up their own businesses. So I'm really mostly worried, obviously, about our general degrees uh, students um, that that graduate with with a general um, research led um, um, discipline like physics. So, so the idea, the way in which I'm thinking about this, uh, I've just looked at the numbers very recently. It turns out that we've, we've, uh, we've had the last cohort just last year, we've had just a, a little bit more than 200,000 bachelor passes. So students who, who finish high school that have the potential to enter into, into university um, as, as undergraduate entrants across all disciplines. So, so that's the sort of numbers that we're looking at. It's useful to think about that. There were about uh, almost at 750,000 students that, that wrote uh, the, the metric, but only that many that, that actually got the uh, bachelor pass. Now, as a, as a physicist yourself, you'd want to be able to select a, a, a certain cohort of those students. If we could do that in advance, that would be great. We'd, uh, we'd achieve a tremendous amount, but we need in principle to be able to select students from this, from this broadband that have the acumen, but also the, the interest. I mean, having the acumen, the abilities is one thing, but also being really super excited about whatever area of study that might be. And it could be microbiology, it could be in organic chemistry, it could be in any other, other discipline. So we want to drive these, these students all the way through the university program up to, to, to uh, you know, PhD, postdoc and, and, and develop excellent researchers. I don't think you're gonna to want to argue with that. That's, that's our aim. But of course, it's impossible for us to identify those students in advance. So, so the way in which we do this is to um, attract a, a, a reasonably uh, wide uh, range of students into our programs uh, with, the, with the view to them being elimin eliminated along the way. There's an, a process of natural selection. And, and so there is this kind of pyramidal structure that, that is necessary in our education system. But as, as if we look at it purely from the point of view of what we want to achieve as, as, 
researchers working in the in the ball quadrant that's kind of what we want we want to have that small but very excellent lot of uh, students that develop develop into excellent researchers and and of course we, we do have some collateral damage in the sense that a number of students kind of fall by the way so that's just the way in which universities have been for the longest time uh, but now for, for to, to, to address problems that are relevant in the in the 21st century, I think we need now to have uh, drive, drive the, 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 the work um, of, of, of our researchers to an entirely new new level. The challenges facing, uh, facing society are, are much more demanding. I think you know that. Much of that is brought about by, by the uh, increase in, in, in population, of course, and, and the, the incredible uh, demands that that places on our natural resources and all of the consequences that come from that. So we really now need to, we cannot be static, uh, driving researchers to a particular level and, and, and kind of uh, continue, continue forever at that, at that kind of uh, level in terms of quality. I think there the should be within us a quest to drive our research enterprise to, to an entirely new level as we, as we um, address or attempt to address the, the many new challenges that are that, that humanity is facing, for example, enunciated by the uh, United Nations Millennium uh, Sustainability Goals. Uh, that would be one, one indication of the types of, of challenges that face us. So, so if, if we're going to try to drive, drive the system in such a way, we would need to increase uh, the, the number of students that we bring into the system and be more selective along the way, of course. But, but that, is, that is going to be a problem because um, because of, of, of the real, real issues that I've already alerted you to, and that is the lack of academic research positions within, within our research and university systems. That is, a, that is a reality and that's not about to go away. So, so the way in which I think we can do that then, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction, is to really uh, drive your system uh, far enough to produce excellent researchers, but at, at some appropriate time, and I would suggest that that happens at the PhD level, that we increasingly develop uh, innovators, as students that have the fundamental approach to, to scientific problems, but with a view to resolving real practical problems. And my, my black arrow here is thicker compared to the purple arrow. That's indicative of the fact that more stu students over time in the coming decades should be directed in, in, in this way. But, but also I've, I have indicated both of these arrows at the same height. And that's also indicative in my view that, that one should not necessarily be uh, suggesting that somehow uh, going the innovation route is, is, is a lesser option. I think we need to make it much more an attractive option. And that is my, my solution really is to, to, in order that we drive the science system to a greater extent in the ball quadrant, we need to be driving much more of many more scientists into the, into the um, pasture quadrant. And, and I'll explain more of that in, in a moment. So, so I believe we need to produce more innovative graduates there's this implicit understanding that I've already suggested that, uh, that our students will be more innovative, our PhD students, but the question is, are they? They certainly have the potential to be more innovative. Of that, I have no doubt. But how do we unleash that potential? Um, and how can we integrate this, these ideas of innovation in a, in a more formal sense? So, so uh, let me share with you some of the ideas that, that we're developing within BITS. I see I just have another 10 minutes or so to go. Uh, Francisco, do let me know uh, when, when you need for me to stop. So uh, the innovation entrepreneurial commercial ecosystem does indeed exist. Uh, it's debatable about how well that works, but currently it depends on step one. Step one being you, whoever you might be, you could be a student or a researcher, arriving at, at this level with, with some kind of uh, viable idea, concept, prototype, whatever, whatever that might be. And once you have this idea in hand, then, then an entire system of entrepreneurship and commercialization does kick in. There are lots of steps, and I'm not going to go through all of this in the interest of time, but I do want to say that it's not sequential. There's great potential for things to go wrong if you just can count up the number of ideas that arrive at step one and the number of ideas that, that actually succeed as, uh, commercially, then the probability is probably less than 1%. Uh, so there, there, there are all, all of these kind of steps that really reside mostly in the business world. And as a scientist, you might say, well, maybe that's not of interest to, to me. But of great concern to me is what is the environment that we need to be creating uh, to ensure that we have an in increasing number of, 
of viable ideas that, that, that arrive at step one. So I refer to this as step zero. It's a basis of innovation. And much of, of that ethos and environment really resides on the science side rather than the business side. And that, that is why there's much work for us as scientists to be doing rather than just simply passing. The, the buck over to the, to the business world. We as scientists need to be thinking more about what we should be doing to, to enhancing innovation within our areas of endeavor. So the three, three issues that I have with the current system, one is we, we depend to a very large extent on ideas percolating through the system accidentally. So it's not being driven in a concerted way. Secondly, I think the system has, has really tried to encourage our scientists to work much more on, on applied research on, on the bottom right hand quadrant in the Edison quadrant. Uh, and and that, has, uh, that has created, as I've suggested, a lot of damage along the way. If, if you look at typical supervisors, senior academics, they don't really want to dilute the disciplines. If I go to, and I'm often picking on my good friend, Robert de Koch, he's not gonna be too upset when I mention his name. He's a string theorist. If you get Robert to, to you know, if you force him to go and build a, a, a low cost house, he's gonna get a little bit grumpy. So, so that's the thing. You, you can't force supervisors that have spent all of their lives uh, becoming excellent in their particular area to all of a sudden change tack and become more innovative. So my solution does not impact on, on, on the work of the supervisors. The third issue that I have with the current, current environment uh, as, as it currently, currently works or does not work is that the system often is trying to pull ideas out of science from the business world. So on the business side, you have folk that kind of try, they have scouts getting out on the science side and they try to yank ideas out out in the business world, that, that is horribly inefficient. That's just not gonna work. And, and, and what we need to do is to change the vector direction of that, of that um, relationship. We need to be pushing out more ideas out of science in the business world. And that responsibility lies entirely within our hands. And that is the essence of what step zero is. I asked, what is step zero? It's the environment that needs to be set up, enhanced to ensure that more innovation takes place. So you know that innovation uh, lies in the ingenuity of science. That's the basis of, it, of innovation. The university is a reservoir, so we're not trying to uh, clutch at, at straws here. There already are viable, viable ideas out there, but I don't believe that we're exploiting those ideas sufficiently. It's probably a cultural, cultural thing, the way in which we think about innovation, and I'm certainly keen to, to, to uh, change our mindsets in, in the country on this matter. And certainly within the IUPAP, as you know, I serve as vice president. I've also been pushing these ideas quite strongly. We need to change change this mindset. Uh, quite uh, innovation is 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 certainly an important part of science. We we often want our best students to remain in academia. The question is really why. I'd like you to really think about that. Why do you always want your best students to remain to to go on to pursue an academic job? Could they not also have a satisfying and productive career? by becoming really excellent innovators. So, so do think about that. So, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna kind of move along a little bit. Um, so, so, so the key idea that we're developing at BITS is to expose our PhD students to the ideas of innovation during the PhD degrees, not after that. I, I, after, after PhD is what we currently have, students graduating, not being able to find an academic job and then desperately looking out to what they can do. Uh, so, so the ideas that we are, are exploring is, is, is to set up a formal training program in innovation in science in parallel to the PhD program, not, not uh, sequenced after that. Perhaps it can happen before, but, but not after. And, and my preference is for this to happen simultaneously. So this slide here really will speak uh, in a little more detail to what we're doing. So, so we're setting up a pilot program. We're working quite closely with USAF on this, setting up a pilot uh, dual degree program that I referred to in my, in my commentary in the APS uh, um, article. So, so a student then would register for a PhD and, and simultaneously for this new qualification. Initially, this is being set up as a postgraduate diploma in innovation over one year, but I hope that it will morph over, over time into an <coughs> MSc in innovation over 18 months. And so over four years then, whilst you're doing the PhD and the, and the additional qualification simultaneously, the student graduates with two qualifications, the PhD obviously, and the PhD is untouched. If you're doing string theory with Robert, that's what you're doing. But by night, because this could be done part-time online, there would be 
hands-on projects and so on that will be uh, happening on, on your time. Obviously, we want to choose our students very stringently across all disciplines, not just within science. And, and we're starting off with 40 students. They will be interviewed very uh, carefully, ensure that we select our students. They've got to be really smart. It's going to be an elite program, uh, hardworking, ambitious to succeed in the innovation space. So, so all you really need is for the supervisor to say, yeah, I'm fine with you over a four-year period to get your PhD, but also this additional qualification. I don't really need to get involved in what you're doing by night, but, but I support you. And that's all you really need to, need to be doing. So the, um, once again, time is really difficult for me, uh, colleagues. So the, in, uh, the MSc in innovation is, uh, is, is going to be taught by, by scientists. That's a, that's a clear part. That's, that's the important part. People who have actually walked the journey from scientific principle to successful, successful enterprise. So, so we will be teaching the innovation part by way of case examples. Students will be working in syndicates uh, and, and, and multidisciplinary. So you'll have a problem that requires students from health sciences, engineering, chemistry, physics coming together to solve a problem of, of mutual interest. So they will work on projects from start to finish, building on prototypes and so on. And, and obviously learn by, by doing and walking the path of successful, successful innovators. So, so that really is, is the essence of, of what, we, what we're doing. So uh, in a previous slide that I didn't show you, I, I did ask the question, what's the difference between an MSc in innovation compared with an MBA in innovation? I, I think the latter is really firmly lodged on, on the business side. And it's those folk that are trying to pull ideas out of science. I think the MSc graduate in innovation will be the one who's, who's going to be exposed to these ideas of innovation. Uh, upfront and and since this is being done simultaneously with the PhD, they will approach the PhDs with 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 innovation in in mind. So 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 the this is my final slide. Then colleagues, I, I have no doubt that uh, that the consequences would be quite profound. I, I uh, there will be a new research that emerges from this. Uh, it's quite a kind of novel way to think about research driving innovation and innovation driving new research through this upstream effect. I think that's an important, important way to think about it. Obviously, we expect more entrepreneurial activities, startups, spin up, spin off companies and so on. Job creation is what we're looking at. Obviously, the, the impact on society is uh, is, is, is important uh, and, and I believe that we will continue, certainly at WITS we believe very strongly that we will continue to strengthen the res reputation of WITS as a research-led institution whilst driving innovation, not, not undermining that. Thank you, colleagues. Yeah, thank you very much, Nitya, for an excellent talk uh, that gave us some, some food for thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I see everybody was, uh, I think, very uh, attentive listening to your to your words, and, and nobody has posted yet uh, uh, questions in the Q and A. But since we are not so many, uh, I'm happy to offer the the participants the opportunity to to raise their hand uh, virtually, and then I'm happy to give them the right to 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 speak and 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 so that they can ask their questions <clears throat> on their uh, on their own yeah and, and maybe while people uh, start thinking about uh, questions <clears throat> let me ask you uh, a question uh, as well you know an, an obvious uh, question yeah since um, uh, you gave your talk within the ex nitep new nitex uh, colloquium is uh, um, and you know, and, and 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 we are setting up this, this new institute that um, that that will um, address many more disciplines, not only physics. Yeah. So how what uh, what can an institute like like ours uh, do to contribute to this uh, slight change of mindset to 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 encourage more people to uh, to be inno innovative in, innovative in a in a practical <laughs> from a point economical point of view way yeah do you have a, a, a suggestion sure. for that I mean, since since i myself am a theoretical computational scientist i've, I've often thought about this so at, at the UKZ in when i was there many years ago we did institute an undergraduate program in um, computational physics which are sadly collapsed after after some some key individuals left there, but uh, that was the only um, bachelor of science computational physics degree that was offered in South Africa. So one could graduate with physics and 
computational physics as, as a major. So I would say that from an educational point of view, bottom left-hand quadrant, I would, I would give that a lot of attention. And I think Nithix could, could certainly spend, spend uh, time, although you're a research-led institution, I think you can certainly champion the importance of, uh, of uh, developing computational physics at the undergraduate level. Now, at the postgraduate level, particularly the PhD level, when it comes to computing, uh, I, I find far too many, far too often now, uh, do you find students that are using large production codes that, that are in, in application mode, just applying this to, with a view to, to understanding the, 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 the science, the physics of, of, a, of a system of interest. Now, that's a very legitimate um, endeavor. There's no question about that. But, but I do have a question as to whether we could call those individuals computational scientists, maybe computational technologists or operators, I do not know. Those are very negative terms. But, but a computational scientist is one that really genuinely understands how to translate a scientific problem to um, uh, algorithmically and then, then eventually to computer code and, and writing their own codes, w working within a, a Linux uh, um, environment, um, graphical uh, visualization and animation and analysis of data, especially in the context of artificial intelligence and, and, and machine learning and so on. All of those skills, yes, I, I think even though you could be pursuing topics that are most theoretical, most esoteric, I think we as, as researchers have this enormous responsibility to ensure that our students do develop these practical skills. It, it might be easy for you to just simply teach them to use a code and then you're very interested in applying this to a new problem. But actually uh, from a science point of view as well, I don't know that that's a very, very good from a pedagogical point of view, not a very good, good position. So those are the two areas that the undergraduate level as well as the postgraduate level, I would, I would strongly encourage that Nethix takes, uh, takes under its, its, its wing the, uh, the responsibility of, uh, of promoting those, those ideas. No, no, thank you, Anita. That's exactly what we're already doing, because uh, you, you might know that at the moment we are running a, a mini school, which is a, a course that extends over the full months uh, on, uh, on Python for data science. Yeah? And, uh, and we have 300 registered, <laughs> about 300 registered yeah. participants every week. Yeah? So we, we are starting the foundations for, for that. But well, in that, the meantime... Very good. I, I do want to say that Africa is an extremely important uh, uh, opportunity uh, for for making an impact, and and uh, South Africa is often viewed as a gateway into Africa. So I would also suggest that you you, you know you consider very strongly when now that we're having a lot of our activities uh, online, it's, it's it shouldn't be a difficulty for us to include students that are really working on extraordinarily difficult circumstances elsewhere in Africa. I think through that, then uh, you you can get a lot more support from international organizations when you seem to be as, as Nithix to be reaching out into Africa. I would also encourage that very strongly. We have already several uh, participants from other African countries that, uh, Excellent. that joined Probably. us regularly. Probably well, even this evening we have a few <laughs> that are not from South Africa. So in the meantime, I think Yingxia raised his hand and uh, and would like to ask a question. Yingxia, you have already the rights to, to talk, and I will allow Paul to be the next one. Hi, Yenzema, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Yingxia, are you, are you with us? He's still muted. Uh, I gave him the right. Hello? Okay, then. Uh, ah, hello? Hi, Yinke. Please, please. You, we, we can hear you. You're welcome to to ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, first of all, Nisia, I, I, I really, uh, I mean, really, really, my great pleasure to meet you here. I, I miss you the time which we work with you as an astronomer representative in NRF. Uh, during the time, so I, I, you know, we we share your passion of astronomy, etc. So it it was a great time that you work with, uh, you know, with, with astronomers. Thank us. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Same here. Yes, and I think the um, yeah. So basically, a few years ago, I had a uh, also chat with our VC, uh, uh, Albert Van Yasvet by the time. So really, I think the research, teaching, and innovation, these three things should be like uh, three points in a triangle, which should dynamically integrate with each other. And that is what we call ecosystem. So today you, uh, you beautifully put the 
relation between research and innovation and, and highlight the importance of uh, channel great student into innovation. I, I totally buy that. Uh, but I also want to just add in my point that innovation with the establishment of this ecosystem, the innovation can also have a lot of input into research and also into teaching uh, as well. So there will be a, a you know could be a lot of students a, a training program that being implemented as the uh, way to innovation. So that that will just enrich our educational program greatly. Uh, so yeah, that that's I think not a question, but uh, I think a, a comments or an addition to your talk. Yeah. Yeah, so, so thank you, Enzima. I, I appreciate your very kind, kind remarks. And yes, we did show sure have, have a lot of uh, excitement for the six years that I was involved in, in astronomy at NRF, and a lot's been accomplished in that, in, in that environment. So, so there is a, a strong interplay between the four quadrants, and one, one should keep that in mind. I notice you talk about education uh, and uh, research and innovation, but there's also the applied research and applied research is not the same as innovation. So that's the part that we need to think about a little bit more carefully. It's not entirely the overlaps, but it's, it's, it's more restricted. So, so really it's, it's, it's a, um, the, the four different endeavors, they're highly networked and connected, but you know, I, I think we all can be very adamant that if we do not have the ball quadrant at, at a typical research-led university, you can forget it. You've got to sustain an environment where there's open, unfettered inquiry. That was the, the point that I, I tried to make in my American Physical Society commentary. Thank you. Um, Nitya, there is another question by Paul Els. Paul, um, you're welcome to, to ask your question, and then uh, there will be a question by Igle Glethill. Okay, thank you. Am I audible? There we yes, go. Yeah. If you could just introduce yourself, please. Oh, please. oh yes. Sorry. Uh, my name is Paul Els. Um, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm currently a PhD student at Northwest University. Uh, thank you again for the talk. This is, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. Um, it's, it's something I think we could probably spend all day talking about because a, I think it's an extremely important subject because it's sort of the future of science we're talking about. Um, and B, it's it's something I personally, I don't know why my video isn't on, um, but regardless, um, that I personally wonder about a lot because I see this constantly and you were talking about um, getting your best students to, you know, become postgraduate students, to do PhDs and continue in science. But what really is the driving force that you you have to introduce let's say uh, school graduates to an academic route because a lot of the people i i uh, was um, at school with that would have been excellent researchers went off to something that paid better where you know you they actually make very good money because you know that makes life a lot easier and especially with our economic um, circumstances in south africa i i sort of have to ask the question, how, how do we drive um, better research if science fundamentally doesn't pay scientists too well? Um, for instance, I had the conversation with a colleague of mine recently where they were talking about, you know, publishing in some journal, I'll not name anything, and, you know, it's several hundred US dollars per page if you want to publish. Somebody that, you know, let's say you want to get a high school student inter interested in science or somebody that does research but isn't affiliate, affiliated with a university, they don't really have access to that amount of money to, you know, do research. So I'm sort of seeing this, this disconnect between being able to, or the, what's the word I'm looking for, the um, openness of science, the... Uh, the word is slipping my mind now, but how accessible it is. <clears throat> so, so, so let me come in. It's, you know, society is wide enough and broad enough that there would be a place for, for, for many, many folk with, uh, with many different talents and opportunities to contribute. I'm very sure that, that a great number of folk would be driven by the, the, the need for material success early on. And, uh, and that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but thankfully, the, you, we, we do have uh, students, uh, excellent students who are driven by, by the passion to understand. And, and that is there, and I, and I believe, uh, believe that that is, that is very real. And um, of course, there's always the potential to increase that number, and, and therefore we, we, we need to be reaching out 
to, to communities, especially those who have not been exposed to science, to excite them into science. That's an important part of what we need to do. But I come to the quote uh, early on about, about the value of society being measured by the dreams of its, of its children. And, and we need to continue to, to ensure that our students have this aspiration to pursue science in the purest form of the, of the word. So um, I'm not too phased about it. I, I, I think that the science system is, is, you know, if there's more funding available for, 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 for bursaries that we would drive the, the numbers up. At Wits University, I've just pointed out more than 100 PhDs to graduate this year. So that's not, a, not an issue. So we have a great number of folk that actually believe in, in science and its importance and, 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 have, uh, and have been really excited about pursuing the, the, the field of study purely from an academic point of view. I don't think that one should just simply look at it in terms of whether, whether um, this pays in a lucrative sense or not. I'm, I'm very sure that if a student does well enough in their work <clears throat> innovatively or purely academically that the, those doors will open I'm, of, of that, I'm sure. Okay, yeah, I, I thank you. I, I didn't want to come off as too negative. I might have. Um, it's it's uh, a conversation that was driven by a uh, conversation I had with uh, somebody at my uni or at my university that mentioned um, they were at the uh, uh, I think it's the Laurel or Laurel uh, uh, International Laudit uh, the the Nobel meeting. I, I can't remember the exact word for the thing, but Lindell, uh, yes, yes. Um, and he asked the question there of of the the invitees uh, that were attending, how many had um, uh, obtained tenure, um, and it was a low number. So I, I definitely believe in you know the love of science and the the um, genuine pursuit of pure science. I've I've been seduced by that uh, as well, but. I, I, I'm, I'm starting to worry that maybe we, we, we should just also um, link the idea of innovation with um, ideas that are both innovative and that uh, can help us in our funding research, if that Thank makes you. sense. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have maybe one last question by, by Igle Glethil. Igle, please. <laughs> Hi, Francesca. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. you are. You're good to well, see you again. Thank, thank Hi, you very Nithya. much for joining us this evening. Yeah. I would introduce myself as an applied um, computational physicist um, who's also a visiting professor in aeronautical engineering. And um, I, in listening to students, I find that in my experience, they're excited by examples of the Edison, Bohr, and Pasteur quadrants on your diagram that are introduced into lectures and site visits. Apart from anything else, this raises um, possibilities of jobs. So um, to tackle this in a small way, why would education be confined to the lower left quadrant? Surely there would be, it would extend, it would reach in and out from the other three quadrants as well. So, so I referred mostly to in, in high school education that would more or less kind of uh, present it, 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 uh, knowledge and information that already exists. But but you're right. I mean, the, it, the, those boundaries are not absolutely um, rigid. And, and I certainly would like to see undergraduate students being involved a lot more in, in applying their, their, their work to, to, to solving real problems or going the other way to, to, to exploring uh, research uh, projects that, that are reasonably new, maybe pushing the boundaries a little bit. One has to be realistic. In some institutions at third year level, students do do a project, certainly at honors level, now all students do a project. And that project could well have, have real value in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of uh, inquiring a, into a subject uh, material that that is that is still new, and some honor students even publish uh, publish uh, papers. So it's it's not that uh, I've not um, encouraged that, but it's just a reflection of reality. If I define education as being more or less the high school and undergraduate cohort, then it would be it would reside principally in the bottom left hand uh, left hand quadrant. Cool. I'm, I'm happy with that. 
And yeah, I I've like the research led. I've talked. Sorry, I've talked about research led, led uh, yes. education. So that's what you're speaking of, bringing those ideas in the classroom. And, and I absolutely. Like yeah. Um, yep. And I like the idea of the doctorate in philosophy and innovation. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Eko. Good. Thank you, Igor. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Okay, I'm looking at the time, <laughs> and I think you know, all good things come to an end. Yeah. Uh, so, Nitya, thank you so much for a really nice, uh, nice talk that um, gave us a little bit of food for thought, and uh, and 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 hopefully also motivation for action. Yeah, because you can't only think about it; we need to do it. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> it would be very nice to to to. To keep uh, to keep in touch, and and maybe in in some time invite you back to tell us how the masters in innovation at Wits is is doing, and and maybe to share the first uh, success stories, so that maybe that could be a model that other university could pick up as well. So, thank you, thank you thank very, you much, very much for the invitation. Much appreciated. You know, thank you for, for for your time and uh, and for I know that uh, as dean you are probably very busy. So thank you very much also to all the participants that um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, that are with us every Monday, and the the advert for the next colloquium will probably come out tomorrow because we had to remind the speaker to send us the abstract. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we will be here uh, next week at the same time in the same place. And if you want to learn Python for data science, join us tomorrow afternoon at two you find the link on our website. Yeah? Nitya, thank you very much. Uh, all the best. Have a good evening and, uh, and stay safe. Yeah, because <laughs> we are not yes, yet Thank you. <laughs> yeah? yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye.